This week on Africa Weekly, we meet the lady lorry drivers in Ghana, working for a company that claims to be the first in the world to employ only female drivers. Then we head to the Democratic Republic of Congo, where the island of Ijwi remains a haven of peace in a region dominated by unrest. But first, here's a look at the stories that made the headlines this week. South Africa's new president, Cyril Ramaphosa, who won the election for the ruling ANC with an historically low score amid anger over corruption and joblessness, has vowed that a new era is underway. They were saying at national level, provincial level, local government level, we must end corruption. And comrades, we are going to end corruption. 57% of the electorate opted to give the ANC another chance, enough for an outright majority with 230 seats out of 400 in Parliament. Ramaphosa took over last year when the ANC forced Jacob Zuma to resign after nine years in office. Thousands of residents have fled their village in northeast Nigeria's Borno state, fearing renewed attacks by Boko Haram after a recent raid by jihadists. Thousands of residents of Molai village, five kilometres outside Borno's capital, Maiduguri, have poured into the city following a raid by Boko Haram militants in which six people were killed and dozens of homes burnt. Security was tight around the parliament building of the West African nation of Benin after the swearing-in of 83 newly elected lawmakers following deadly post-election violence. Police and soldiers ensured there was no repeat of protests that erupted after the 28th of April parliamentary elections, in which at least four people died. But residents are sceptical about what kind of change the new officials will bring. I am in complete mourning because, one way or another, we've put in power the leaders that people did not vote for. To be frank, I am not at all happy. I'm in mourning. We've seen the death of democracy. The day after a deadly attack on Burkinabe's Dablo Catholic Church, in which six people were killed, a government delegation visited the area. They attended the burial of the six victims, five worshippers and their priest, who were shot dead shortly before the church was set alight. Burkina Faso has suffered from increasingly frequent and deadly attacks attributed to a number of jihadist groups. Terrorism, which appeared as a threat at our borders a few years ago, is today a brutal and cruel reality that is spreading throughout the country and in other areas that I am convinced we're experiencing a false sense of security. At Natitingu in northern Benin, visitors mingled with locals to pay their condolences to the family of Fiacre Beji, a tour guide murdered by jihadists after they kidnapped two French tourists in the Penjari National Park. Elite French troops managed to free the abducted tourists from Islamic extremists, but their expert guide had already been killed. Located in the west of Ghana, the port city of Takoradi is a hub for transportation businesses. It's here that Payan Marfa runs her women-only trucking company, Ladybird Logistics, as well as empowering women in a male-dominated sector, employing female drivers brings other benefits to her business. I think the female drivers are more cautious, they are really careful. Um, maybe it's a female thing because we are always thinking about the children that we have at home and making sure that you don't want to take certain risk. Every day in Ghana, hundreds of truck drivers take to the country's ramshackle roads to transport petrol to mining sites. It's a job that's traditionally been done by men. A 2014 survey found that just 0.3% of Ghanaian women were employed in the transport and storage sector, compared with 7.7% of men. With over 20 female drivers now working at Ladybird, the reaction from other companies and from male drivers has been positive. They're good drivers. We've not had any major incident to date. So I think now there's a lot of respect from um, the men, and they realize that these ladies are good drivers. 
Following in the footsteps of many of her family members, Abigail Amoa was already working as a trucker. But when she heard about a new company employing exclusively female drivers, she jumped at the chance to get involved. For her, it's not just about doing a job, it's about becoming part of a company that is trying to break down gender stereotypes in Ghana. So I feel so proud, because I helped me a lot. So I'm encouraging other women. You see, we have companies, but all female, that was the first time in, I think even, not Ghana, the whole world. So I'm encouraging other women out there to join the campaign for us to empower women to drive. It may have only recently been created, but this trucking company has big ambitions for the future. Drivers like Abigail want to set a precedent in the country that they hope will pave the way for change in other industries and sectors. Nestled near Rwanda on Lake Kivu, the Congolese island of Ijwi is a small natural paradise. It's the only place in the region untouched by armed militia groups seeking to impose their rule on rural communities. Luc spent over a decade fighting for justice at the UN on behalf of victims of war crimes committed in the country. Today, with his wife Esperance, he has taken on a new mission, developing ecological and solidarity tourism in the DRC. The potential of Ijui Island is enormous. Here, there's no risk of being harassed or of being bothered by anyone. You climb on the peaks of the island, you're more than 2,500 meters high. You have views of Lake Kivu on the Congolese side, views of the Rwandan coast on the other. Breathtaking views and the perfect climate for growing coffee. Many of Ijui's inhabitants make a living through its harvest and production. The local cooperative buys coffee cherries from producers across the island. Previously, our parents used to go to Rwanda to sell coffee. But as soon as we organized ourselves into a cooperative, we created a local market here at home. Local markets have helped to develop another pride of Ijwi, its pineapples. They're harvested by a women's association led by the wife of the traditional chief, the Mwami. With its oranges, sweet potatoes and bananas, the island is seen by some as an isolated paradise of tropical abundance in the heart of Lake Kivu. But the seclusion, the views and the harvests come with a drawback. Here, there's no electricity grid. Hospitals, hotels and hostels are connected to the internet all day long and in the evening Wi-Fi is free for the rest of the community. As modernization slowly trickles onto the island, some dream of becoming tour guides, a chance to show off their slice of paradise to eager tourists from around the globe. But to grow their hospitality industry, they'll have to climb over a bureaucratic hurdle and convince the DRC government to follow in Rwanda's footsteps and relax its restrictive visa policy. Kenya's Olympic 800 meters bronze medalist Margaret Nyerere Wambi can feel her career slipping away from her following a new ruling by the International Association of Athletics Federations. The IAAF now requires sportswomen with high levels of testosterone to take medication to suppress it. The 24-year-old is one of several star female athletes affected by the ruling. The IAAF says the rules are necessary for fair competition, while critics highlight that the very nature of elite athletic success is down to one kind of physical advantage or another. Welcome to the world's first pigeon opera. Here in southwestern Nigeria, Helena Pega captivates the crowd. In Africa's most populous nation, many ethnic groups and hundreds of languages exist. But Nigerian pidgin, a lingua franca sometimes referred to as broken English, is understood by almost everyone. And now that it's being put to music, its power to unite is even greater. That's all from us at Africa Weekly. Until next week. <laughs>